Scott Denholm's out of Tennessee. That is not a hub as far as legal cannabis is concerned, and it's because he works with RFID, radio frequency identification. So he tags products. He does everything from race cars to now cannabis, and that's because he did some consulting work for the state of Colorado. So he's got a great background, and he tells all. Enjoy. So here it is. It's Scott Denholm time from Metric from Franwell. Scott, thanks so much for uh, sitting down with us, if you will. Well, thanks. I appreciate it, Seth. Yeah. So uh, first, we want to make sure that uh, everybody understands that you're there in the uh, cannabis hub of Tennessee, correct? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm about as far removed from the marijuana industry as you can be down here in the South. Well, and the reason is, though, you know, let's just kind of give them the overview and then go back to the beginning. But you you guys are a track and trace company. You're an RFID company. You guys are a logistics company, right? And uh, you saw a need and then came into the cannabis industry. Don't let me fill your, uh, fill your mouth for you, but uh, take us through it. No, that's, I, I think you hit it on the head. You know, I, I can honestly tell you, you know, 25 years ago when I first started getting into the business world, this was not the direction I thought my career was going to go into. Uh, so this was, you know, quite a surprise. Um, I was actually out uh, doing some consulting work on my own for a while um, and ran into this, uh, you know, consulting job for the state of Colorado. I took that job and uh, did some work with them and... And lo and behold, you know, the next thing you know, this thing is spinning up into a big business. So um, it, it definitely was a surprise. But, you know, to your to your point, you know, Franwell is a track and trace company, uh, track and tracing race car parts and property and evidence and fruits and vegetables and pharmaceuticals. Uh, and that's kind of what got us into this when, you know, this opportunity came up in Colorado, there really wasn't. Uh, there was a, f- a few small companies uh, in the industry, and but there was nobody that had this track and trace RFID technology capability. Uh, everybody in the industry was still using barcodes, and for the most part still are, uh, except us as far as I know. Uh, but this was really a means to how do we do a technology and do a skip level technology to take the marijuana industry into the future and uh, that's why Franwell was chosen. It was, you know, really about how much knowledge, how much experience uh, do you have in markets as close to marijuana because there was no marijuana experience. How could you get close and make this thing happen? And that's where we came into the fold. All right. So that that's who you are and, and what you do. That sets the stage for us, and we certainly want to get into what you guys are doing over there in cannabis, and, and we certainly will. But are you originally a Tennessee guy? Let's get some background on you first. Uh, no, I'm not a Tennessee guy. No, you, you'd probably think so from my heavy southern accent, right? Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm actually a transient. I grew up in California in the 70s and then uh, lived in Washington, D.C. in the 80s, uh, then moved to the Florida in the 90s, and now I'm in Tennessee. Okay. And so I, if I'm doing the math, uh, Tennessee has you for most of the time. Uh, right now, yeah, I've, here, I've lived here about uh, almost 11 years now. So actually, the vast majority of my time was in California when I grew up. Okay, so let's go back into the 70s in California, southern or northern? Southern California, just outside of L.A. in the valley. Okay, and so what, what were you into? Was Were you a Dodgers fan? I mean, I think that this is before the L.A. Raiders. That's when they were still in Oakland the first time, correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so, I was a, I was a Dodger fan, and I was a uh, L.A. Rams fan at the time. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, you know, played football when I was you know in high school, things of that nature. So, um, but yeah, it was definitely you know the California experience. You know, I had the long hair. Um, I was very familiar with the uh, marijuana industry before it was an industry. I see. Okay. And uh, as far as your Rams uh, fandom, this is before Eric Dickerson, correct? Uh, this was actually Jack Youngblood, and uh, er- and yes, it was definitely it was pre-Eric Dickerson, but it was back in the uh, Jack Youngblood days. Okay. And then your Dodgers would have had Steve Garvey on them, if I'm not mistaken. 
That's right. That, it was Steve Garvey and uh, it was uh, uh, Tommy out there who's the coach. And uh, I'm trying to remember Dusty Baker playing sure. first base. That the whole the whole gang. Yeah, and and Tommy, you speak of you you in Southern California. You you only have to use Tommy. We know him as Tommy Lasorda. That's correct. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. So seventies experience. You're you know fun and in the sun and having an enjoyable time. You're playing sports. What position did you play in football? Uh, I played I li- played tight end and a little bit of uh, middle linebacker until uh, everybody caught up and then I ended up in the in a free safety position. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, I know you, and uh, you're not a tight end as far as uh, humans are concerned. Maybe when you were a kid. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, it was that it was that growth spurt thing. I just hit mine a little <laughs> faster than everybody else, and then they started catching up. And uh, then all of a sudden, you're not linebacker material anymore, buddy. You're going back to the, you're going back to the backfield. <laughs> you're so free safety. So that means that you you can run. I mean, you can just keep going, right? I mean, that's the well, soccer I, player position, right? That it really was. It was you're not fast enough to be a corner. Mm-hmm. But you are, you can stay afloat because uh, what I did in the off season was I ran, the, did the four forty and eight eighty, in track. Oh wow! Okay, so you're a fast guy. You're playing football in the off season. You're doing track. What about uh, off the field? What were the interests besides uh, the <laughs> cannabis industry before it was a cannabis industry? Uh, well, the, the cannabis industry before it was the cannabis industry and, and <laughs> girls. I mean, it's a teenage guy that in California. That's all there was to it. <laughs> So you you were you were just fine, and then uh, how you know what age were you when you when you moved out of California? It sounds like it would have been utopia. Why ever leave? Uh, you know, it was just a lot of things. It was the seventies and early eighties, and um, you know, it was one of those family things. Time to you know check out the rest of the world. So I actually moved out from California where I live with my mom and then uh, moved out to Washington, D.C. where I live with my dad. So it was just a family thing. Got it. Okay. And so mom and dad had split when they were in California or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The uh, It was definitely, there was two sides of the family. There was the West Coast family and then there was the East Coast family. Uh-huh. And dad was... So, uh, yeah. Dad, dad just had like d- the rappers, right? D- absolutely, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, I guess maybe even the, uh, you know, the the inner fighting to to go with that, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was the way it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have brothers or sisters, or was it just you? Uh, I have I have two brothers. Um, one of them actually, one of them left California to come out here and live in Tennessee because uh, after living in California for so many years and outside of LA, uh, the quiet life out here in Tennessee gets to be quite appealing. God, so, uh, yeah. yeah, he he just went for that. So, but the did the two brothers at the time come with you to DC DC to live with dad, or was that just you? No, that was just me. That just was just you. me. They were. Uh, yeah, because I moved about halfway through. I actually came out for like my junior year and senior year in high school. So they and they were both older, so they had long since graduated. Got it. Okay. So now junior and senior year, you're out in DC. Are you still playing football? Are you still doing all the sports stuff? Yeah, you no, know, you know, I kind of dropped all of that when I got out to DC and I just said, you know, this is a it was a different world, different mentality. It took me two years, you know, and I, I never really uh managed to fit into that it took me a long time to fit into the dc culture coming from california uh washington dc very political and uh you know the nation's politics are the local politics in california or in washington dc so it really was a different kind of mentality and you kind of got to get used to that and that took a little while Absolutely. It's night and day from Southern California to D.C. I mean, the the cultures of New York and uh, Southern California are closer than D.C. and uh, Southern California. And the cultures of New York and Southern California are not close. (laughs) That's absolutely. You said it right there. So So was your dad in the government or? uh, No, it just happened to be where they they grew up. Uh, My parents both actually grew up in and around Washington, D.C. They were uh, my mother's uh, father was military. He was an Air Force colonel. Um, And uh, uh, my father's family just uh, I guess they just moved down there back after I don't know. I think it was probably in the early 1900s, you know, moved from uh, came over from Scotland 
then headed down south until they hit DC and just parked. And <laughs> just parked there. That's where we'll be. That's it. Uh, and uh, thank your grandfather for his uh, service, whether he's with us or not. Will do. And uh, so then, how did we get out to California? If the if the base of the family is in DC, wh- wh- where did the California trip come in? Well, you know, honestly, it's kind of funny. I, I'd say my <laughs> grew up a good, strong Irish Catholic family, and uh, my mother was the oldest daughter of eleven children. Um, so. You know, when she hit 18 and my parents got married, I think they stopped in California because they ran out of continent. I think she just wanted to keep going as far away mm. as she could. You know, it was just more of a, well, I'm out of I'm out of continent, so I guess I'm going to go ahead and stop here. <laughs> that's uh, that's totally fair. All right, so and then she stayed. She stayed. And then what does she? What does she do? What did she do? Uh, she passed away a few years back. Okay, as did my mom. But what did she do for a living when uh, when she was with us? Oh, she was just uh, working at the telephone company. She was a uh, supervisor for operators back in the day when they actually had operators, right? <laughs> for Ma Bell. That, for, that was it. <laughs> and uh, for Beastie Boys fans, uh, they'll be familiar with Ma Bell. Uh, as that will, they will absolutely. As will old people. So, uh, yes. okay, so D.C. in the 80s, you know, whatever, I do my junior, senior year there. I'm just trying to figure out D.C. because it's not Southern California. Where did you go to school? Where did you go to university? Actually, I, I left high school and joined the Navy straight out. Okay. So, so here yeah, we I go. just joined the Navy. And, yeah, joined the Navy, uh, ended up on an aircraft carrier in 1986 and, uh, and uh, was just cruising around on the, on the big bird farm. Uh, we got to hear all about this. There's actually a fair amount of, uh, service in the cannabis industry, service history in the cannabis industry. Uh, just off the top of my head, Andy Joseph, uh, was a Marine. Uh, we had, uh, well, that's just a one off the top of my head. Uh, but, uh, as far as the Air Force is concerned, 1986, why did you decide to, to join and thank you for your service? But why did you decide to join? You know what? It was it was a lot of being 18 years old, not really knowing what I wanted to do with my life and what I wanted to do and, you know, how could I go out and see the world? And, you know, I bought into the recruiting posters, right? <laughs> so, you know, so I went, went to school and, uh, you know, or got out of school and joined the Navy and, you know, uh, went to basic training. They put me on an aircraft carrier and sent me around the world and, uh, you know, went to went to Spain, went to France. Uh, saw that wonderful island, Diego Garcia, which is a rock out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, wonderful, fun stuff like that. So, uh, but my ship, yeah, you know, I never really saw any combat like the the, the people that serve today. Mm-hmm. Uh, my biggest thing was we were in in '86 when we did the uh, raid on Libya. Uh, but you know, being on an aircraft carrier for that was not much of a big deal. It was a, it was just a couple of days that were a little bit more busy than the other days. Understood. M- mostly a positive experience. What did you say? You you mentioned uh, <laughs> that phrase with birds. I completely missed it. What was that phrase? Uh, well, we just said aircraft carrier. We just called it the bird farm. The bird farm. And why do we call it that? Oh, because of the planes, uh, of course. Oh, yes. that's it. We had <laughs> we had we had eighty different aircraft or eighty aircraft on our plane, about five different models. And now, were did you fly or no? No, I was what they called a deck ape. Uh, I was an aviation bosun's mate equipment handler. I was in charge of uh, chalking and chaining and uh, hanging out on the flight deck. If you ever watch the movie Top Gun, you'll see the guys running around in green shirts. That was me. Absolutely. I was just literally, as you described it, that's the movie that came to mind. Okay, so you're you're on the deck there. And then how long did you serve for? I was in for three years. Okay, 86 to 89. Yep. All right. And, I mean, what was the key lesson learned, understanding that it wasn't too much combat at all, it was uh, more, you know, kind of a positive experience, and yes, very organized and regimented, but what uh, what did you take out of there? What was the key lesson learned? The key lesson learned was get an education. Aha. Uh-huh. <laughs> get an education, get a skill set. Otherwise, this is what you get to do. <laughs> and so what uh, then did you do? 
Yeah, then, well, once I got out, I took my money and uh, I went out to, and I got myself an associate's degree in electronics. Uh Uh-huh. And learned learned all about electronics and learned about uh, access control and working on computers and working on just anything, basically anything electronic. It was an associate's degree in electronic engineering, so, you know, basically get out in the world and start working, there you right? Go. So it was a quick way to get a good skill set behind me and uh, get into a career, and that's where I started off in uh, working on security technology. You can do something that not many other people can do. What is the point there, right? So a- yeah. ADT security, what were you doing there? So actually what I did there was I, I started off in field service, right? I was the guy that would uh, do technical support for the service techs in, in the field. And uh, I did a pretty good job, so they asked me to come down to the corporate office in Florida. That's why I ended up leaving Washington, D.C. and moving to Florida, mm-hmm. was went down to the corporate office to do um, technical support and product training. Excellent. And then how long did you stay doing that with ADT? Um, I had a number of careers. That's where my career really started to take some interesting turns. I went from a technical support position doing uh, supporting field service to a uh, a lab manager. I actually ended up running a lab uh, with about five or six people, uh, and I ran that lab for about three or four more years. And then I was actually asked to take on a product development role where I oversaw product development, new product development, and continuing product development for security products. So I had a number of different careers in there, and those things ended up uh, driving me in the direction that I went in today. So there was a lot of uh, moving out of the technical side and moving into the management side. Why do you think they kept on coming to you with uh, very different things? It's interesting. just you know, it was just an acumen for uh, really being able to listen to people, understand uh, the difference between what they say and what they mean. Uh, people were uh, people always tell you what they want. They explain what they want in a way that they think you understand, as opposed to just telling you what they need. And so my skill set really revolved around being able to listen to people, understand what they were saying, and discern what they wanted, and then being able to turn that into something uh, viable. So, you know, a lot of my career has been around documenting what people say, what they want, and turning it into an actionable item that could actually turn into uh, some sort of real answer, which is how I ended up getting into the marijuana industry. Uh, You know, a lot of what we do as a company is really listening to uh, you know, the regulators, the state officials, the industry people uh, talking about their problems. And I'm a big believer in don't tell me, don't tell me the answer you're looking for. Tell me the problems that you're having. Let me see if I can figure out the answer to the problem. Excellent. Give me a, a, an example, if you can, from anywhere along the way, from ADT to Motorola to, to Omni Troll or uh, Outlaw Technologies right. or even Metric Today, where, you know, uh, this is what I said, but I actually meant. Uh, this. So I said A, but I meant B. I said X, but I meant Z. Well, right. Well, you know what? People, you know, so people would try, let's take, we'll take metric because it's something that's fresh in the head. You know, when we got into this years back, you know, five years ago, uh, people said, you know, we just need a really good barcode technology so we can do a good job of tracking all of our plants. And, you know, if we just had some good technology in here, you know, we could see what we wanted to do and we could see the effects of, of a good, of a well-run business. So show me, you know, show me a good, you know, barcoding technologies and things that we can use to make this work. And so I looked up and I said, well, let's, let's stop. You know, don't tell me what the technology you want is. Let's just let's walk through uh, the operations. Show me how things work. And so they would show me, you know, I, I went through, you know, a dozen cultivations and a, do, uh, a couple of uh, infused product manufacturing facilities. And so I'd, I'd watch them, I'd take notes, and I'd listen, and then I'd ask them, you know, what are your biggest cost expenditures? What are your biggest concerns? 
And when you go into a cultivation, uh, you know, the, the growers, they're very picky people and, and understandably so. I mean, these are their plants or their livelihood. So, you know, we'd get into these conversations where they would ask me about, you know, or tell me about, I just stay away from my plants. Don't touch my plants. Okay. You don't, I don't know what's on you. You could have dust on you or dirt or mold, or, you know, you could be, you know, you could cross pollinate my plants. You know, I don't want anybody around my plants. Um, so let's get in, show you and get out. Well, that screams right off the bat that showed me that, you know, barcode was never going to be a viable technology for this industry. Uh, even though it's, it's the most pervasive industry or most pervasive used technology in the industry right now, people don't want anybody touching their plants. Well, if you don't want somebody touching your plants, the last thing you want them to do is be grabbing the plant and pulling a tag around and looking for a barcode on it. And if you've been into a cultivation, which I know everybody listening to this is going to have been in multiple cultivations, you don't want people reaching in between your plants because now you're going to knock off product, you're going to be breaking branches, you, know, you just don't know what's going on. So, And then talking to people about their labor savings, you know, it takes us so long to do an inventory, it takes us so long to manage the inventory, my inventory is never right. Well, that's once again, it screamed, it screamed RFID because it's... How do I make sure that I can go into a room full of 600 plants and in 10 minutes come out there with a 100% accurate inventory? Well, you can never do that with a barcode, right? I mean, barcode, it's just, it just wasn't going to be the right answer. So you know, those are the kind of situations that I found myself in over the years, and that's why I have a couple of patents, is you listen to people, you discern what their problems are, and, and look for the answers to their problems, and, and don't look for a solution. You know, there was a, a, a comment made, I really loved it a long time ago on a television show, is, you know, if you hand somebody, if you're only looking for one answer, that's the only answer you'll find. If you put a problem in front of people and say, tell me what's going on and give me an answer, then you can search for something and find the right solution. Well, that's, uh, you know, Steve Jobs uh, created the iPhone. If he was listening to folks uh, at the time, you know, he would have just made a much, much, much smaller phone. Uh, so yeah, no, absolutely. Don't necessarily listen to, uh, what the solution, uh, uh, that the, uh, end consumer has in mind, uh, listen to the problem. Great point. Now you already brought up uh, metrics, so that's fine. Let's stay there, but just quickly, let's backtrack to the consulting that you did for, mm -hmm. for the state of Colorado. How did you find yourself consulting for the state of Colorado and what were you doing? <laughs> Honestly, you know, I, I was out uh, on my own at the time. And uh, what, we, what happened was nobody wanted the consulting job. And, um, you know, being uh, out there on my own, I looked at it and said, well, you know what, I'll take it. Um, it's, you know, if nothing else, it's a goof, right? I did a consulting job in the marijuana industry. So, it was a, you know, it was a good cocktail party story. But, uh, you know, when, when it was out there, uh, the bottom line was there was a number of companies that wa wanted – to do the consulting, but they couldn't do the consulting and then bid on the contract, which is, hey, typical of, of any integrator, right? I mean, you'd love to be in there and you'd love to talk to all the, all the people in charge, but at a certain point, you pass that point of being a consultant to being, you know, or you pass the line and then you're a consultant and you no longer can bid on a job. So, you know, there's, there's a, several companies that were interested, but they didn't want the consulting piece. They wanted to go after the contract. And uh, I was perfectly happy to take the contract. <laughs> I was perfectly happy to take the contract. Fair enough. And so it was with the state of Colorado? Yes, it was. It was for the Department of Revenue for the Marijuana Enforcement. Okay, so you were in the perfect uh, place at the perfect time. And you were working with uh, such people as Louis Kosky, I would imagine? Uh, actually, this was pre Louis Kosky days. This was uh, uh, Dan Hartman days. Okay. And uh, what did you, you know, what did you do? A to B, B to C. What did you do? Well, well, it was really a, you know, uh, the the department, the marijuana enforcement division had looked at at going internally or externally and how they were going to develop the system. Uh, they really were looking at, you know, how can what can we do and how can we do it. Uh, they had some concepts. Uh, and basically because of my supply chain background and, and all the, you know, the manufacturing processes and things that I've worked with, 
Um, as a product development manager, I spent a ton of time in our in my own company's manufacturing operation, understanding and you know lear- learning about ISO and uh, learning about good manufacturing processes and just in time and all those great things for manufacturing, uh, which is where my experience started from. And uh, but asked me to bring that experience and knowledge to the state and say how could the enforcement division use that understanding and that capability and that technology background to work with the state to define a system that would actually make sense for the state and for the industry as opposed to just being a burden on the industry. So Dan Hartman uh, had a tremendous amount of vision uh, in how that, how that all needed to play out, which is where you, you know, I ended up getting the job. Which is what? Uh, that's how I ended up getting the contracting job. But from that, that's the point where basically I worked with, you know, a number of different cultivators work with the state to outline uh, what uh, what ultimately would become the metric system. Excellent. Okay. So you're outlining it, uh, you know, right uh, at the right time in cannabis in the first state uh, that uh, is doing it. Uh, where did you take that expertise uh, to next, obviously you brought it to Franwell, and then what state did you uh, what yeah. state did you go to next? Well, you know, at the, at this point, it's really you know a number of different states. I mean, we you know everybody can. We'll probably run down the list where we've ha- most of the companies that are doing it. I've been in. It's been New York and Illinois and Nevada and Oregon and uh, Washington and Hawaii and uh, District of Columbia and Tennessee. I mean. Uh, you know, it, it just you name it. I've been everywhere, but uh, probably everywhere but Alaska and California. Okay, and I just got back from Alaska, and uh, so uh, I can tell you about Cindy Franklin, or you can listen to the episode, Scott. Uh, but uh, I will listen. There to the episode. you go. But what what uh, what do should we know from your perspective, from the track and trace perspective? As you go into each of these uh, states and 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 speak to the folks uh, behind the scenes, what are they telling you? Uh, we know what you're telling them, but what are they telling you about the differences between uh, their various, uh, you know, the the way that they're running things in the various states? Well, I think you know a lot of them. You know, two years ago, a lot of the states that we talked to uh, came in and said, well. You know, we don't like the way anybody else is doing this, and we're going to do it differently. And they thought, you know, Washington and Colorado, well, that's the wild, wild west, and, you know, it's all crazy, and, you know, we don't want to be like that. And, uh, you know, I think what's really changed over that period is a lot of them are going, okay, well, we see that they're in compliance with the federal government now, which is where we want to start, but how can we take what they do and then do it better? And so, you know, we, we really are trying to help them now, but they're not, a lot of states aren't coming at it now from, from an arrogant level of, we know what we're doing and we're going to do it our own way. They're coming at it going, okay, let's see if we can get our hands wrapped around this and, and let's see what we can do to improve. Mm-hmm. Um, but like I said, a lot of them, you know, the, the sad and, and, you know, I don't, I certainly don't want to sound, um, non-compassionate. But a lot of what I hear off, you know, kind of behind closed doors and off the books is, listen, you know, I I really don't want to talk to any more sick people. This is coming from a legislator. You know, I don't want to talk to any more sick people. I understand the kids and and the patients and all that. And, you know, every year I I get hammered with, you know, by these people. And, uh, you know, I'm tired of looking like I'm not compassionate and I don't care. But I can't put a program in this state, in my state, you know, this is what they're saying to me, is we, you know, we can't put a program in there that's just going to unleash marijuana when we've got problems with methamphetamine and we've got problems with crack cocaine or we've got, you know, you know, hillbilly heroin or whatever, you know, whatever that state's issue is, you know, they're just like, I cannot, I don't care about the sick people. I can't put, I can't do something for them that's going to create a bigger problem or another problem in my state. Interesting. So, you know, that's a, you know, that, and that's a, a, a comment I'd make to all the advocacy groups is that, and it's not that the legislators don't care, they do, but, you know, the advocacy, a lot of the advocacy groups aren't sending, they're not giving them the full answer. And I think it's, uh, you know, the advocacy groups are doing a great job of showing the benefits. But right now, this is address, need, what needs to happen is addressing 
the regulatory and legislative concerns so that you can get the medicine to the people because that's the roadblock. Interesting. So we've we've almost proven the case in terms of uh, in terms of patients, in terms of uh, cannabis as medicine. Uh, that is not ne- necessarily anything that needs to be proved in these some of these states that you're talking about. Uh, it's more no, yeah, not at all. It's more uh, proved to me that it's not going to go hog wild. Then wouldn't it be, wouldn't the next point be, and not that you would make this point, but wouldn't the next point be, look at crime being down, look at teenage use of cannabis being down now that it's legal in uh, in these states? W- wouldn't that be the next thing to point out to some of these legislators or no? I think it absolutely yeah. is, Seth. I yeah. really do. I mean, what, you know, the, what has to happen is, and, you know, and I think the Obama administration has said it a number of times, is, you know, Oregon and Washington are the great are the great test proving grounds, right? And let's see what happens. And I think you're right. I think, you know, the big lesson learned coming out of 2014 was, you know, the world didn't fall apart. You know, the entire state of Colorado, you know, there isn't a giant cloud over the state of Colorado and an inversion layer that doesn't let, you know, a marijuana smoke that doesn't let planes land. You know, there's, you know, the, the, the sky is falling mentality that everybody predicted didn't happen. You know, it's almost like, you know, 1999 back in the, and I'm going to date yeah. myself, you know, with the Y2K bug that everybody <laughs> thought every computer in the world was going to shut off and everything was going to die <laughs> because the millennium flipped and, you know, and it just and didn't it happen. It did not happen. And uh, uh, did you know any Y2K administrators uh, at the time? Because I did. Oh, uh, yeah, I knew a lot of them, and boy, there was a lot of gray hair, and I knew some Y2K survivalists, too, that had the, you know, that had the guns and the well drilled in the back of the house and 500 pounds of rice in a shed, you know, so, so, but, you know, but I think your point is spot on, is that, you know, the industry, you know, the, what needs to happen is regulators, and it, and it is why, by the way, it is why we have the number of legislators that are reaching out and the number of uh, you know, seed to sale tracking systems that are being requested by these new states and why regulators are now, instead of me having to call them all yeah. the time, uh, I'm getting invites to places now. So, you know, uh, you know, I think, I think that is really going to turn, but I think, you know, 2016 is going to be the watershed. That's every, that's what everybody's right? saying. So, you know, we, we talked about the, the states that kind of uh, still aren't there, but let's talk about Nevada. Let's talk about Illinois. Let's talk about Massachusetts. You mentioned Oregon. You know, folks that obviously are uh, on the path here, wh- what are you hearing from folks in those states? Well, you know, uh, Oregon and um, Oregon and Nevada both doing a great job. I think both of them you know, were very smart. They put out RFIs. Right, they put out requests for information before uh, they did the request for proposals. Right, they they went out and said, "What's the lay of the land look like?" Uh, building off of uh, off of what happened, uh, and I think those two states really did a great job. I think uh, you know New York and Illinois. Um, it, it's a start, right? You know, you can't criticize them. You know, for for trying to take a very conservative. Um, you know, let's get started approach and let's see where this thing goes. I know a lot of people in those states are pretty disappointed uh, with how the programs are starting to look, uh, but it is a start, right? So they're going to, you know, it, it's it's the East Coast versus the West Coast again, right? Back to that mess, uh, which another reason why I can find my way through all these things. <laughs> uh, but, you know, New York and Illinois are, are, you know, taking a very, very conservative approach um, and, you know, we'll follow suit. And, you know, the wild card out there is the one that nobody talks about is Canada. <laughs> you know, I don't know why. I mean, Canada is up there with a medical program for several right. years now. Uh, and it, they've got their own challenges, and it's, it's not perfect. Uh, but a lot of, you know, the U.S., I guess it's just the U.S. mentality, hasn't really looked up north uh, to, to look at that program and see how it's working and what could be done or and, improved and on. And you well know that's exactly why we're doing our next cannabis economy in Vancouver in a couple months. Right. And I'm looking forward to it. There you go. That'll be... Uh... That'll be where we'll answer some of those questions. And, and for you, uh, you know, I feel like uh, it's, it's come up on us uh, quickly here, but I want to ask you a couple of uh, final questions. And, and the sure. last two questions that we always ask are, uh, you know, what has most surprised you in cannabis and what has most surprised you in life? 
So in, in terms of the fact that you were doing consulting for the state of Colorado, you really were in uh, the, the state office when they were uh, figuring out how to do all this to begin with, uh, all the way through to now where you're talking to both states that are far, far from, uh, from getting their stuff together to, uh, to kind of leading the way in other states. What's most surprised you in cannabis? Uh, I think, you know, a couple, well, there's been a couple of really surprising things. Uh, the number one surprising thing that I've seen is, you know, I have not seen the pushback, right? When I tell people what I do, uh, you know, and it's fun if, you know, when you're in a business development role, being able to look and people go, well, so what do you do? Well, I sell tire irons. I sell tires. I sell widgets. What do you do? I track pot. Okay. Well, you know what? That gets the conversations going. <laughs> but when I do that, the, the interesting thing is. I can tell you in all of those conversations, I've only had a handful of people look up at me and say, that's terrible. Right. You know, and I've told, I've talked to hundreds of people not related to the cannabis industry and the pushback, I still don't buy these numbers when you see, you know, well, 54% or 60% of, you know, society approves it. I think it's higher than that. Yeah, because I just don't, you know, and it's my own statistical sampling methodology, right? It's a hundred percent of the people I talk to. I just don't <laughs> see the pushback that would get that would tell me that thirty, forty percent of the, you know, U.S. doesn't like it or doesn't yeah. think it's valid. And, and what's so, crazy is that you're not based in New York, L.A., San Francisco, Colorado, or Washington. You're in Tennessee, as we mentioned before. Yeah, I am in the deep south, okay? And if you look at the marijuana regulations in the marijuana state, there is an arc that goes from starts <laughs> in Arizona, New Mexico, all the way up through, you know, up and around, down to Illinois, New York, Massachusetts, into Maryland. And it's this big bubble around the south. <laughs> and it, it almost know? circles in, in totality uh, Tennessee, as a matter of fact. Yeah, it really does. I mean, it just basically you go Georgia, Tennessee, North South Carolina, over to Mississippi, Louisiana. There's your bubble, <laughs> right? So, Absolutely. You know, and so no, I, it's just amazing to me that that uh, the pushback that ever that it's from the polling that you see in the newspapers and everything else. I think a lot of that is people would tell you, you know what, that. Uh, we just don't want to go on record saying it's okay because, you know, people are paranoid about what they put their opinions to. So, mm. so, so that, yeah, that would be the number one surprise that I've learned um, in the marijuana industry. The other thing I would tell you is, is the, the lack of, um, there's certain lack of understanding about from the industry about how good they have it for a little while longer until this is federally legal. I'm uh, surprised a lot that the industry still hasn't caught on to the fact that uh, this is the time for the small mom and pops to make hay. This is the opportunity because when the you know when this gets reclassified to a Schedule Three, uh, or you know the banking laws and this happens and that happens, you know the the big companies are just sitting there on the sidelines and they're waiting. And I look at the a lot of people in the industry that are just clamoring. For from an industry perspective, I mean, I know why the advocacy groups do it, and I understand it, and it makes a lot of sense. What I'm saying from an industry, yeah. you know, the growers and the sellers, it's don't you're pushing too hard. I mean, you know, for you guys, you really don't want this to be federally legal that fast because it's it's you know when that bubble pops, I'm hoping you're in the right place for it. I mean, I think that for the most part, the business owners that we've spoken to certainly understand uh, what is in that shoe when that other shoe drops. Uh, I feel like business owners absolutely kind of get what's going to happen. And yes, uh, I take your point. Uh, advocacy groups just want to get it done because that's what the what the whole point has been from the beginning. But I think the business right. owners do do understand it. I mean, when when it, listen to the the infused products manufacturers that we've uh, spoken to and the the producer, I think they definitely get it. You know, maybe some of oh. the dispensaries, maybe they don't. You know, maybe some of the smaller infused products manufacturers uh, don't because they they, they just want to be mom and pop uh, you know operators, but. Uh, I don't know if I 100% agree with you on that one, but that's well, why I, we I have would these say conversations. You, 
Yeah, I, I would tell you, I agree with you on the infused. The infused product manufacturers are definitely different from the cultivators, right? Okay, fair um, enough. Yeah, you know, you know they they are. They, see, these are GMP people, good manufacturing process people, right? right Most right. of those the the MIPS they come from an environment where uh, of packaging and bottling, and you know, a lot of them really get what we do from a regulatory standpoint. Uh, because they that is an environment they come from. Most of what I'm talking about is just the cultivators who, okay. you know, stand up a grow and, and, you know, they look at it and go, well, why do I need to care about what every plant comes from? Why would I have to have it tested, you know? And, and yes. oh, that's, you know, well, we just want this thing to be big. And it's like, look, you know, to, to the cultivators, I look up and go, you know, listen, 10% of you guys are going to get bought. 90, you know, 70% of you are just going to get run out of town by the big, by the big, you know, ConAgra's and Monsanto's of the world, you know, and then, you know, the other 20% are going to be, you know, nice boutique shops. So, you know, there's going to be a lot of people that when big business does get into it, that can make some money. But I, I worry a lot for the smaller businesses. I really do, because I like, I, I know, I know, you know, I work with over 2,500 licensed businesses in Colorado. Okay. We've, we've tracked over two, two and a half million plants, like 40 metric tons of marijuana in the last, you know, 16 months. And I've gotten to really know these people. And, you know, the vast majority of them are just really great, kind hearted, wonderful people. Uh, Absolutely. You know, you know, and I really, really like the industry. And it's more about guys, you know, Make you take your opportunity and make good on it because I want to see him successful. There we go. And then the final question: What has most surprised you in life? If you can uh, take that uh, yeah. apart a bit. My, you know, my involvement in this industry never seems to uh, stop amazing me. Um, you know, I look. Uh, you have to stop and take a look around and go. You know, I never in my wildest dreams thought that this was going to be an industry, that it would be this big of an industry and that I would be in the middle of it. It is amazing, isn't it? And then having to look at my, uh, my son's teachers when he was in the fourth grade and say, listen, if my son comes in, he's talking about pot. It's not that we smoke it or grow it. It's, <laughs> this is what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> it's paying the bills. It's buying his books. That's right. Scott, uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, looking forward to seeing you down the line. It, it seems like I see you every couple months, so uh, looking forward to it. All right, Seth. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the time. Tennessean Scott Denholm. Uh, very much appreciated uh, talking with him. Really interesting that his uh, out-of-the-box consulting work for the state of Colorado has led to him uh, having a career in cannabis and even better that he is there in uh, the southeast of the United States and uh, no one thinks it's crazy that he works in cannabis. 